Hello, I'm David Stishon, and this is a presentation on the beginning of the American beef business. In 1865, unemployed former Confederate cavalrymen and millions of wild maverick longhorns gathered idly in Texas. Across the plains, there was no money, but lots of beef. Throughout the East, the cattle herds disappeared from the needs of both armies in the Civil War. The Northerners had plenty of cash, but little beef. Raw materials in a market lay thousands of miles apart. At the same time, in the Midwest, a conglomeration of investors opened the Union stockyards on the south side of Chicago on Christmas Day, 1865, and only needed more meat to get the slaughterhouses working to full capacity. One entrepreneur gathered the raw materials and laborers in Texas, rail cars in Kansas, and contracted with packing plants across the Midwest to provide thicker and cheaper steaks for tables across the world, starting with almost nothing. One thinker brought all these moving parts together into one system, Joseph G. McCoy. Like many, McCoy looked for business when army contracts dried up after the Civil War. Discovering cheap cattle and mounted labor in Texas, he hatched the idea to get the longhorned herds to railheads in Kansas, then delivered by rail to the packing houses in the East, and then distributed his beef to stores everywhere. The idea came to the 30-year-old former mule trader is a flash of inspiration that seemed to provide pay and meat for many folks. All the parts of this beef assembly line had to be planned, financed, and factory owners convinced to become a part of the enterprise. Perhaps no other business idea came to fruition so rapidly in peacetime as McCoy's Beef Bonanza. In 1865, a cattle drive struck out for Abilene, Kansas along the Chisholm Trail to find a tiny stock town established by McCoy. Rather than fight the many mounted Indian warriors in their path, the trail bosses offered a cattle toll of a small percentage of the herds for safe passage. Thus, Texas Longhorns began to replace the diminishing buffaloes for some Indians as sharpshooters hunted the bison into extinction. Beginning the first year of the drive, cowboys drove an average of hundreds of Longhorns each day for years through a wide city street to a stockyard past McCoy's three-story hotel and bank to meet Kansas-specific rail cars headed to Kansas City, Chicago, and other points east. In an extreme act of trust, McCoy convinced part of the Union Stockyards Group to front him cash to buy and bring them Texas Longhorns by rail from Kansas. Within 10 years, the newly invented refrigerator cars allowed the shipment of uncured beef to anywhere in America. At the same time, some of the packers added canning to their business and offered corned beef and roast beef to, on store shelves around the world. The United States always used tax dollars to promote both Western immigration and agricultural development. President Thomas Jefferson invested 15 million tax dollars to obtain Louisiana purchased lands, but they sold slowly as antebellum farmers had little desire to settle in the great American desert. Through the Homestead Act, the government offered the sodbusters a nearly free farm of a section of 160 acres for a small fee and five years of living in a soddy daisy. Advertising widely to sell these prairie lands along the rails throughout the eastern Scandinavia is almost free land. The railroads promised to transport bulk produce cheaply to markets back east and return with new neighbors. All seemed to work well until rowdy Texas cowboys drove herds of thousands of longhorns across farm fields and brought along the deadly Texas cow tick. Six shooters and Winchesters faced shotguns and marshals. As a result, Every few years, the cattle drives struck the rails ever westward at Ellsworth, Wichita, and Dodge City to stay ahead of the settlement line. About the same time that barbed wire fences blocked the herds, railroads became common in Texas. The cowboys then took their best stock to Montana and other border territories and made the transition from drovers to ranchers. By 1885, the open range cattle drives ended forever. The American beef business brought cash back to a destitute Texas in the pockets of ragged veterans after they lost the Civil War. The smart ones bought more cattle for a dollar apiece in Texas and continued to deliver beef on the hoof in Kansas for up to $45 a head. While the packing trade hired tens of thousands of immigrants and freedmen, it proved a hard and unhealthy living long after factory unionization in the late 1930s. The buffalo chips and cow patties are long gone. But today, the bison herds now number over 100,000 head on public and private lands. The Native Americans live on reservations or among us throughout the country. There are cowboys still punching cattle in each state, and Native Americans, African Americans, and women are some of the best riders on the rodeo circuit. 
the nostalgia of the cattle drive still entertains in movies and on television as it has in dime novels for 150 years. All this business resulted in more beef consumed in this country than pork. But most forget the name of the original entrepreneur, Joseph G. McCoy, the real McCoy. I'm David Stishon, and I hope you've enjoyed this presentation on the beginning of the American beef business.